Hello, Fight Fans. My name is Jimin Kim with my friend Ricardo Jean Pierre. And we are recording a podcast for Line Fight 20, where we will preview the main event and the co main event for an online startup that my friend and I started called All Kickboxing. And we hope you enjoy this episode of the Clinch Podcast. So, to begin, the main event for Line Fight 20 will be Urena Bars versus Chantal Uji for the Women's Welterweight Championship. And the co-main event will be Chris Mosseri versus Sidisak Poor Sirachai. Now, I say we go straight into the main event, Rico. What are your general thoughts on Urena Bars versus Chantal Uji? Um, what I like about Urena Bars is that um, she's very good with the with the right low kick. I was watching some of her past fights. She's very effective with that. Um, she is very good with her striking. Um, not so much when she fights within close range, but when she's just outside the kicking range of her opponents, she knows how to evade high kicks. Um, she's good at um, throwing from a distance, and she's very exceptional with the teep and kicking off the ropes, which is one of her her tricks that she has, as well as that at that instep knee, which is she's very good at. Um, as for Ugi. She's she's a very good grinder. She's good at clinching. Um, she has amazing knees. She fights well within the pocket, and she's very good at clinching and just I'm um, breaking down opponents. I seen her fight um, for Tiger Muay Thai against. I f- forgive me, I forgot the last name of the opponent, but her first name was Tracy, and she won a TKO because she was really controlling the opponent and throwing multiple knees. So, what we're gonna see a lot in this fight is um. You're in a bar trying to fight outside of the clinching range, and um, Ugi trying to get inside that range and dominating um, bars. Do you think Ugi will be successful in closing that range effectively without taking damage? I don't think so. I think that Ugi will definitely take damage when she wades into the clinch. However, once she gets into that position, she'll be effective for as long as she can hold bars. Either by bars getting out of that position or by uh, um, forcing a reset, which I've seen in some of the past matches where she, it would seem that she allows herself to fall so she could get a reset. From the referee. From the referee. So, uh, you're in the bars for fans who haven't checked out her last fight in line fight against Chris Cyborg, who is one of the most famous female MMA fighters in the world. Yorina Bars beat Cyborg for the Lion Fight Welterweight Female Women's Championship. What are your thoughts on Bars after you saw that? She stopped doing Muay Thai after that fight, from what I learned. And you she, mean MMA? Oh wait, wait. When she fought um Cyborg? Yeah. She stopped fighting after she fought Cyborg. Yeah. She moved on to MMA, and then she decides to come back. Am I correct? No, it's actually the other way. Oh. After she went 1-3 and three in MMA, she said she's not going to go back to it, and then fought Cyborg as a return to Muay Thai. Oh, okay. I stand corrected. <laughs> I stand corrected. Messed up, son. <laughs> I did. I messed up. <laughs> all right. So, what are, you, what are your thoughts on knowing Cyborg and all the people she's destroyed in uh, Strike Force, Mixed Martial Arts, and seeing Bars really best her in the stand-up game? I believe that um, Bars is much better at stand-up than um, Cyborg. Cyborg was really trying to do what Uyi does, was close that distance, um, close the range, and attack her with um, with clinches. But um, Bars was really good at um, using the teep, creating the distance, using the ropes um, to create that distance and throw knees. And she actually dropped Cyborg multiple times. Something that you don't usually see when Cyborg fights, but she was able to do it, and she won by decision. Yeah, she did. Yeah. In the beginning, the first round after a Bars dropped her, I believe it was two times. Once when Cyborg came running in over eager to trap Bars in the corner of the ring, where you would think that Bars would be very, uh, that's a very bad position for her. But like you said, what Bars does is that she has so much experience in a kickboxing Muay Thai style fight. She knows the little tricks of how to use the ring physically, where she holds herself on the back of her on the back of the ropes, braces herself on the turnbuckle to balance and to launch a solid 
teed right to her opponent's face, and that was the first drop. Cyborg ran right into it. And then later, he sets up a right question mark kick, head kick, to drop Cyborg again, and then Cyborg, like, a, like the Terminator, gets right back up. So, one of the best attributes about Yorina Bars is that she really knows how to fight long. She stands at 5'11", she's 26 years old, she is young, uh, and her record is 36-0, and 0, unblemished, and she will be defending the Women's Welterweight Championship against Ugi in this fight. And her best attribute is her ability to stay mobile and not only hurt opponents from the outside, but at times when she is effective and gets her opponent's respect, she's able to hold the center. But against fighters like Cyborg and even against Ugi, these gritty, hard-nosed fighters who have perhaps just as much of a size advantage. I think in the case of Cyborg, Cyborg had a strength advantage and size advantage. They're just not going to stop pressuring forward. And Yorina Bars does not have, I believe, the strength to get him off of her effectively and consistently enough to where she controls the center of the ring and dictates the range and is forced to fight a, like an outside game, which throughout a fight against a pressure fighter can be very tiresome. And if a lot of your strikes are based on long-range attacks like low kicks, high kicks, and teeps, those shots are going to come a lot slower when you get tired, and mu making it much easier for the shorter, less lankier opponent to step in with punches, to catch kicks and then trip you, or catch kicks and then punch you to coming in. In the case of um, Cyborg, what she did really well was earn bars of respect, not in the first, but throughout the fight, but just by just not coming but by just not stopping by always coming forward and eventually she started to wear down bars by bullying her in the clinch by tossing her throwing her dumping her and really at the times landing solid straight punches when bars had her head uh when bars had her back against the ropes and had her head swinging up in the air static upright and i think that's one of the problems of being a tall fighter is that you can you're so focused on holding that range and being far away from your opponent. Tall guys, tall female fighters, they sometimes have a habit of just leaning back because they're so used to the height and reach advantage. They try to maximize that, thinking that is their go-to one-size-fits-all defense instead of rolling, slipping, going with the, going towards the direction of the punch to make it graze or slip it, and then finding new angles and countering. Rico, as a guy who spars against tall lank your opponents what are your do you see any of your personal experiences fighting those guys play out ver in bars versus ugi by yeah. the way like what are your, your how, how tall are you i am five six five six on a good day <laughs> <laughs> i'm like five six i weigh i walk around at 150 exactly yeah. so you know um let me let me rephrase that mm -hmm. I made it seem like Ugi is a short fighter. She's actually not. She's 5'10". The reason why I'm making this comparison is because Ugi, she fights like a short fighter. Exactly. That's why. Ugi, she loves the clinch. She loves the dirty box inside. On the outside, she has a really solid right body kick, but not as many offensive tools in kicking combination range. So as a shorter guy fighting taller guys, what factors do you see playing out in bars Ugi? Um, the way I see that we parallel in so many ways is that... Um, we really try and close the distance. We make that a prerogative just to, to get in and up and close to our opponent. Um, and that's basically it. Um, we, we work our way from the outside. Um, we try to avoid many of the shots. We try to not stay in the range that's uh, uh, um, beneficial to the opponent for too long. And we, we, we really do try to get inside um, as best as we could. And usually when I spot people that are taller than me, that's what I really try to do. First, um, I usually stand outside of their range where they think they can hit me, but they really can't. But once, I, I, once I'm outside the range and I'm ready to attack, I quickly, it's almost like a blitz. I try to get inside as close as possible so I could, so I could really work my opponent and, and throw my hooks, my body shots, and my low kicks. But when I'm usually outside where they're jabbing, I usually try to stay where they can't hit me, where I know I can't hit them. Until I'm ready, I usually come in with a, like a low kick. Then I try to rush in as close as I can because that's where I know I'm. I'll be most efficient and most effective. So I'm. I'm expecting that I'm going to see a lot of this with um, Ugi fighting bars where 
she's going to be just a little bit outside of the range. But she might get caught coming in. But she's gonna, she's just going to take those punches and try her best to, to ragdoll um, bars as best as she can. Exactly. And do you think when you're a short fighter or you're a tall fighter who fights short, that the only way to fight a taller opponent who really knows how to use that range, that reach, is to make it a little dirty, make it make the fight a little ugly. You're going to have to eat a few shots to land better ones. Do you feel that? Yeah, I definitely feel that. And that's exactly what we're going to see. And I think that's basically what's going to be the, the, the chance for for Ugi to, to keep that welterweight belt is for it to fight a little bit dirty and, and just give Urena Bars a hard time within the clinch. With that being said, Urena Bars has fought people like that who, who try to get in. So Urena Bars has, does have tricks up her sleeves to, to, to counter that. So it won't be an easy task for either of them. Yeah, I agree. I think the most important thing for a shorter fighter or a fighter who fights short to impose on a taller opponent is not just pressure. Pressure alone is not effective. It's making your opponent work. You can, you know, run at them. You can try to march and we're walking them all day. But your, if your opponent is pivoting, circling out, landing Chris Jazz from the outside, teeps, kicks, she's not getting tired. You're not putting any actual pressure on her. You're just getting hit. But what I see in Ugi that is very special is she does not get discouraged. She does not care that she at times is wading into shots just so she can get the clinch. She'll gladly do that just so she can establish that range. And in doing so, she is making her opponent work. Uh, but the question will be if she can really stand up against Boris's power. from Because Boris has tremendous power. She might not look like the strongest fighter you've seen, a strong, the strongest kickboxer, but her strongest attacks are her kicks and knees. The teep I just mentioned, she has a murderous teep to the body. And especially the long-standing knee to the face. A very hard shot to land. I think even for tall fighters, the long knee to the face is very difficult. But the way Bars does it is kind of a kind of a adjustment. She doesn't long knee with the top of the kneecap from a downward, from an upward trajectory from the bottom up, but she just rams it in f towards your face like a straight punch with the front of her kneecap. So it's almost like a like a like a push kick with her knee, and it cracks her opponent's nose. I saw this one fight she had where. Uh, she landed that so hard on her opponent's nose that it broke it, and then they stopped it because of too much blood coming up because of the injury. That is a fight finisher. And Bars, when she fights people who don't get her respect with their power or, or efficient pressuring, she pressures. Bars will pressure, and when she, you're up against the, against the ropes and you have the high guard on, Bars will easily crack through your double forearm earmuff guards with the knee through the middle with that step knee and break your face. And I think that is something that I think Bars can improve on. She's a great fighter. She's an excellent fighter. But one of the things tall fighters, I think, and any tall fighter should really try to improve on is pressuring themselves. That way, when you push your opponent against the ropes, you are in a great position to land knees on an opponent who most likely will be ducking his head down. Uppercuts, much like how uh, Andy Risty knocked out both Georgia Pachoja and Robin Van Roosmal and ju by just <laughs> rushing them to the ropes and then punching them. As a taller fighter, you have much better leverage to land uppercuts than knees because your opponent's chin is really at fist level. It's right there for the taking. So, do you see any uh, weaknesses in Barza's style? Um, In terms of avoiding the clinch, I think she should be a little bit more comfortable in the clinch instead of trying to avoid it all the time. Um, it could be kind of tiring for her, for to you know just avoiding that kind of contact every single time. And yeah, I would like to also see some some knees when she's in the clinch and some uppercuts, like you said. If she's within that range, she she does have the opportunity to to land some crushing uppercuts. Um, I can say from my own experience while sparring, when I spar against tall people lately, I haven't received a lot of uppercuts from them, and I kind of know that. That it's there for the taking if they want to do it, but they don't really do it. They throw a lot of knees, but I'm also expecting that, so I kind of put my forearm out, and I'm not strong enough to 
to break clinch with them sometimes, and they just hold me, and they're able to throw those knees, but my forearm's always in the way. But if, if bars, like other tall fighters should, incorporate uppercuts, um, it'll be very beneficial and, and could really bring damage into, to Ugi. Yeah, I agree. Bars throws the uppercut in the middle of her punch-kick combinations. In fact, uh, her best example of doing this was w in the first fight between Bars and Ugi back in ooh, 2007. Because, yeah, this this rematch at Lion Fight 20 is a rematch seven years in the making. So in, in their first fight, uh, what Bars did to Ugi was she set up a beautiful uppercut, left hook, right low kick combo. Now, the problem with that is she threw the uppercut to, from too far away and overextended herself and, the, and got clipped with a right cross. And against an opponent with better hands, stronger punching power than Ugi, that could have easily been a knockout. Her uppercut doesn't seem to be a bread and butter as the taller fighter. I say that Bars fights, fights more long than she does tall. I know I said the knees, but even the trajectory of those knees, like I said, isn't upward, it's forward, it's a thrust. And if she really knows how to work her height as well as her reach, I think she can be a much more offensively uh, effective fighter. And defensively because good offense can make for better defense as well. Do you think, how much of the fact that Barr seems to have more ranges of striking will be a benefit for her versus Ugi? It will be a great benefit for her versus Ugi because she has a very Dutch style of kickboxing and she knows how to use the range, even though she fights long, um, against her opponent. So, it, it's, it's really going to be beneficial for her. And Ugi is going to take a lot of shots when trying to come in for the clinch. Yeah. Um, when she's in the outside range, when Ugi is in the outside range, um, Barja will be able to, to land a couple combinations. She'll be able to um, come right down the middle, like I've seen her do a couple of times, before, before um, Ugi is able to come in and... and and do what she has to do within the clinch. So what could happen is that um, she could really get hurt. Ugi could really get hurt on the way in, and it's really up to Ugi's chin and her and, and her and her heart in taking those shots when she's coming in for her to to prevail against this. I I think it's also her ability to cut off the ring. But her, uh, Bars's solution to opponents that cut off the ring and opponents that actually trap her somewhere on the ropes or in the corner is again brace herself on the ropes and use not the ropes just for balance but to slingshot her forward into a teep to the face or teep to the body that's what do you think about Barz's ability to use the ropes as a weapon that is pretty that is pretty cool and um it's not something that's uh, um necessarily new there's a couple fighters that that do that in boxing Muhammad Ali would use the the rope right um, um, Mayweather probably has used a rope for defense also. So this is something that um, that she's bringing to the table where uh, um, not a lot of fighters use and it's very it's very unconventional, but it's not necessarily new. But it's, it's definitely going to work for her because now she's using the momentum from the rope in conjunction with the momentum of the fighter coming towards her to, to really give her a powerful blow. The only problem is that um, when she does that, it's a heavy commitment with the team. And she could really... If she misses, she falls right into the range of punches. Um, so she has to use it sparingly. And she has to, to carefully time it and not just throw it any time because Ugi would definitely expect that. Um, they probably trained for that. So so she has to be very careful when she throws that, that, that kick. Yeah, she teeps so hard that if she misses, she steps down on that foot, which is now her lead foot, and switches stances. That's how she must... That's how she, much she commits to that shot. And that is a perfect time to clinch someone up when they're really compromising their stance and they're in a stance that's... First of all, if Bars isn't the best at the clinch, she's not going to be best at the clinch from a position or a stance she's not used to fighting in. Exactly. Exactly. And if you think about it, um, she. I'm, I'm trying to picture this in my head because this is very likely going to happen. If Bars teeps on the ropes, she, stand, she turns southpaw, and then Chantal clinches up right there, that essentially... Gives Chantel two arms around Bar um, Bars's shoulder to her. Really, the only thing Bars has left is really her. And that's that's like the perfect opportunity to jump in and grab the clinch and almost get to the side of your opponent. In this case, Bars's back towards her uh, right side. 
in her southpaw position. And that's the perfect place she, uh, Ugi can hold it to throw her right knee to the body, to ragdoll her. What, what do you think about Bars' ability to really hurt people with that uh, right low kick to their lead leg? Which is re- which, that was the difference maker in Bars versus Ugi 1, where it seemed like Bars couldn't miss with that patented famous Dutch right low kick. Whether she was moving back, whether she was kicking it uh, from the inside or the outside angle, meaning whether she was kicking to the hind of the thigh or to the side of it, whether Bars was moving to the left or the right, she seemed like she could always find her mark with that kick, and it prevented Ugi from really being able to plot forward and establish that clinch or boxing game. What are your thoughts on her ability to really know how to use that right low kick? It is a very effective weapon for Bars. Um, she is very good at it. It kind of reminds me of that fight um between Rufus and I forgot the opponent's name. I, that Muay Thai fighter. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the um the older Rufus brother. Yeah, the the Rufus's old... brother versus the I forgot the Thai fighter name, but that was the East versus West legendary yeah. matchup. Yeah, yeah, from back in the day. Yeah, true fight fans, we will really know. We're, <laughs> we're true fight fans, man. We're yeah. true fight fans. <laughs> yeah, I know that's that's vintage though. I know what yeah. you're saying. So yeah, what about? Yeah, that? but so she throws it repeatedly. So she'll come in with a. With the typical Dutch combo, with the with the jab, um, right, left, and then right low kick, and at the end she just will throw just like five low kicks repeatedly with 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 no response from the opponent, mm. and she's very good at that. Even in the clinch, you see her trying to throw knees at that at that thigh, trying to soften it up. So that will definitely slow down Ugi if she's very effective with that kick, making it harder for her to. To close in with um bars, and and it'll be it'll be it'll be beneficial for bars because um she'll be able to to control the range that way because every time Ugi tries to step in, um bars will respond with a with that right low kick. Exactly. Uh, Ugi, she has an extensive training background in Thailand. Keith Kamporn Gym. That was one of the gyms where she really developed her clinch game. That gym in Thailand specifically focuses on breeding fighters with a really good clinch game. And in Thailand, you rarely see the low kick be a big factor in a fight because Thai fighters, they stand so uh, light on their lead leg. They have that lead leg bouncing all the time, tapping on the floor to not only check leg kicks, but to also throw switch kicks off of it that you rarely see leg kicks be that big of a factor when people say Muay Thai in America perhaps they think of right low kicks all day but in Thailand that's actually very rare because of what I just said before the technical reason but because as a culture they see low kicks as kind of a dishonorable thing really yeah as a technique that doesn't require as much finesse balance or form as a body kick or a head kick you see Thai fighters throw some, I, I believe Thai fighters throw the most efficient effective and well balanced kicks than any other um, fighters on the planet Thai kicks and uh, you would think Ugi who comes from that Thai training background would be able to check leg kicks better to that lead leg but because she is so focused on closing the range and stepping hard stepping down on that lead foot and then switching stances and then like she's walking towards her opponent in the clinch she's very heavy on that lead leg and when she steps down bars was kicking it all day when when Ugi overextended her foot her leg and stepped in range of that kick bars would just eat away at it eat away at it with the leg kick every day so that's one thing that's I think uh, Ugi has to definitely change is you can't we talked about this uh, on a previous podcast how to beat a fighter who has physical advantages over you you can't simply try to force the fight into where you're the best at. It just doesn't happen that way. You have to be willing to compete with your opponent at a range and a place where they're better than you at. Not to beat them at it, but to compete with them at it to where it opens up the door for you to fight them where you're the best at. And most likely, because you're thinking like this, because you're thinking open-mindedly, the other opponent probably has no answer for fighting you where you're the best at. Because physically taller opponents when you get inside their range they have long arms and they're unable to throw effective punches and they almost t-rex their arms they really don't have any meaningful shots other than the uppercut or the knee so bar uh, ugi really has to make sure that she has some sort of an outside arsenal i think to earn bars respect if you if you kick your opponent 
they stop kicking. <laughs> that's the that's very simple. A uh, great example of this was Jose Aldo versus Chad Mendes. This was Aldo's last title defense in the UFC. And in that fight, Aldo threw, I think, I can count the number of leg kicks Aldo threw in one hand, I think, in that fight, which is very rare for Jose oh, Aldo wow. to do. And that was because of A, Chad Mendes' movement and lateral movement, which uh, took that angle away for Aldo to land a meaningful kick. It was because Mendes was out of range of the kick. It was because Mendes was hopping in and out. But really, what I think most importantly, wasn't all of these defensive trimmings, but was the pure act of Chad Mendes kicking Aldo himself. And because Aldo was worried, and he was kicking hard. Mendes actually was kicking pretty damn hard. Hardest leg kicks on Aldo I've ever seen. Because guys are scared to kick with him. And when he did that, Aldo was focused on checking those kicks with that leg, with that right leg, instead of throwing with it. You, that's how you defuse a bomb. <laughs> exactly. You defuse a bomb by making your opponent use it instead of throwing it. Use it in terms of def- meaning defending with it instead of throwing it. So Yugi has to throw kicks. It's simple. She's got to throw kicks from the outside. She's got to teep. She's got to push her opponent back with the teep against the ropes. A great pressure tool and then really make it work. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you. Uki does have to to um, respond in the same way that um, Bars is fighting for her to have a chance of getting to the clinch with less damage than she usually takes. So if she stays within within a good striking range against Bars and is willing to trade in the style that Bars is used to fighting, she might not be the best at it, but she, if she's competitive enough, she'll be able to come in and close the distance without without spending too much of her energy without without paying too much in, in, in receiving damage um i haven't seen any fights where she 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 kind of fights on the outside in the striking range even when she's fighting um opponents that are exactly her height like Tracy was around her height and um they were going at it she wasn't really um fighting in striking range it was more of a of of a clinch match so I spent like two rounds watching them fight within the clinch where where Ugi was was dominating and ultimately got a TKO out of it. So I'm just hoping that um Ugi doesn't do the same thing against Jirina Bars because she'll be prepared for it. She has to be willing to fight on the outside and and, and take away that right low kick that that Bars is so good at. Yeah, Ugi's best shot from the outside is a right roundhouse to the body. Ugi stands uh, orthodox. That's her crispest kick. But she doesn't do it diligently enough. Again, it's only one shot. She needs to mix it up with other blows from the outside. The teep, it seems counterintuitive for a fighter who likes to fight dirty in the inside to use to as an effective pressure tool, as a distance closing tool, because you're literally pushing your opponent away. But what you're doing there is you're pushing your opponent towards wherever you want in the ring, trapping them. You're cutting off the ring and at the same time teeping them into a corner or against the ropes. It's a great distance closing tool for an aggressive fighter like Ugi to use, but that's not part of her game. It's really not. She's a very hard nosed. She's like almost like the, she's almost like uh, the John Fitch of Muay Thai fighters. She just gets in there and tries to tries to drown you in the clinch. And really, technical fighters I feel don't like to fight a dirty fight. I really don't think that's the way it is. If you try to force a dirty fight on a technical fighter, they always try to make it. And turn it back into a technical match where they feel like they're going to school you. This happened with Petrosian and Risty. Or Petrosian is the best at taking aggressive or orthodox fighters and making them fight an orthodox striking match. Having them take turns. That's where Ugi um, can excel at. Is not giving bars a chance to take turns. You know, that that's one thing I saw playing out when, when we sparred. Is that I feel that I'm the best when I fight at a cadence, at a tempo that is um, moderate. Like it's not, it's not like it's, this is a good example. So I'm in kicking range. I kick, you kick, you you miss. I kick back, or I'm in punching or kicking combination range. I punch uh, left cross, kick. You try to do something, I block it or miss. And the, see how there's turns, there's like a rhythm to this? Yeah. But you are really good. Rico's really good at coming in the middle of my shots. When I put him in a place in the ring where he doesn't feel comfortable and he tries to break out of it. So in the middle of that uh, jab, cross, right, low kick, 
he'll come in, stop me mid combination with a flurry. He doesn't wait to take turns, and he makes it a dirt and he makes it a dirty fight. And because I was just in an offensive only mindset, this is something I gotta get better. At. I gotta think defensively, simultaneously, but offensively. Because I had to shift my mindset right away, I'm not in the position to defend effectively to where I'm only resorting to circling out with my head straight up, straight up in the air. Something I see Bars doing as well. Something I see Bars doing as well where she does not like to have her opponent set the 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 beat of the fight. The turns. What do you think? I think that's definitely true. The person who who, who controls the, the, the beat of the fight usually wins the fight. Um... If the other person is willing to disrupt it, the disruptor is the one that has advantage. And like you said, that's what I like doing. I don't like um, having the person um, have a rhythm against me. And I don't really care if you're finished with your combination or not. If I see there's an opening or there's a way to disrupt you and there's a way that I can, I can gain the upper hand in the fight, then I'll definitely do that. So we definitely... Need to see that from Ugi if she has a chance in this fight is to disrupt the rhythm uh, of Yorina Bars mid combination. Um, kind of anticipate what um, Yorina Bars is going to throw, and within that anticipation, kind of neutralize that and come with that attack of her own in the middle of Bars combination. And, and it's not like Ugi has a severe reach disadvantage. She's only one inch shorter than Bars. She can do this. She can counter Bars' kicks with punches by stepping in. Again, she has to fight a little dirty because she likes to fight inside. But that's one of the best ways is timing your opponent's kicks and coming in mid-combination. It's essentially a counter. You're smothering them. You're closing the range fast on them. Mm -hmm. And another thing we can do is, is fire punches after her kicks. You use the kick as a way to close a distance for your punches that have come right after in that combination. And... Uh, It'll be a very stiff test for her because reach, I always say, is is, is a very good weapon. Reach is, a, reach is a gift. Yeah, reach is a gift, but hey, I've been short my whole life, so yeah. I've been taking on tall opponents for quite a while. You kind of get used to it, I guess, sometimes. Yeah, you do. Unless the person's really good at using the reach. What I think is great against taller opponents is... Taller opponents, I feel that they're so used to having that uh, physical advantage that when they lose it, they really don't know what else to do. They're so used to being, you know, the big guy. If yeah. you take that away, they're, like, really lost. Exactly. Great example is, like you said, making it dirty inside in the clinch. But another thing you can do is making them overextend and countering. And I feel that this is harder to do in Muay Thai because in Muay Thai, the range that you start at is really on the fringes of kicking range and then you work your way in. In boxing, I think it's easier to make your opponent overextend and counter. For instance, Rico, you're standing uh, southpaw, I'm standing orthodox. I'm the taller guy. I try to step in with a jab, but you're just out of range of it or you just pull back. And then I'm now in your punching range and then you come with a right hook over the top of my shoulder. It's a clean example, but in Muay Thai, I guess the equivalent of it is I'm a tall person. I try to do a, do a roundhouse. And then I spin around because I miss. But then you still have to do a little bit more extra work to come in closer to throw a kick. What I'm saying is the counter to an overextended opponent in boxing is a punch. But in Muay Thai, it's a lot of times a kick from such a far range playing that overextension game. But then again, you can set up, like I said, punches after those kicks and rush in on an opponent who mm -hmm. has their back turned against you. But I don't think Ugi has the offensive acumen to pull these things off and it's a lot easier said than done when your opponent bars who is very light on their feet loves to circle the ring and has very good movement i wouldn't say i wouldn't say movement that's conducive to at times uh protecting her i, I wouldn't say she maybe has the best defensive movement i see times when she puts herself in positions in the ring where she's very precarious where it's close to the ropes it's close to the corner she doesn't hold the center enough and opponents who can catch her with circular shots, corralling kicks, corralling roundhouse kicks or hooks, can trap her. A lot of activity and circling does not necessarily mean good movement. Yeah, That's like, kind of a... <laughs> I'm talking a lot, folks. It's cool, it's cool. <laughs> kind I'm of listening intently. I've been thinking about this. It's a little controversial what I'm going to say, but everyone thinks of Muhammad Ali as a master boxer, as a guy with extreme light foot, extremely light footwork, you know, um, flow like a butterfly, sting like a bee, right? The Ollie shuffle step. But if you, but then, like, I was thinking, then why is the case that, yeah, he has Parkinson's now? 
You know, why is it that he's taken so much damage in boxing to where he he's struck with this terrible, tragic situation? And I think that's because Ali necessarily didn't have the best footwork. Mm. He was good at keeping you at a range from the outside and maybe discouraging you by doing that. But against guys who weren't discouraged, discouraged by that and closed the ring, Ali had no way to control the center because he was always circling on the ropes. That's one of the big revelations I thought about. It's like, then why is that the case? He wasn't necessarily a, a defensive master. Floyd Mayweather, he's a more defensive fighter than Ali. I think Floyd's like in the top two ever defensive. Because Floyd understands... He'll, Floyd will walk you down. Floyd will walk you down and hold the center. And throw combinations and trade with you. He can fight on... Like he says, he's an altering vehicle. Recently, Floyd has been moving around more and trying to make guys miss more to where he's getting hit now. He's not initiating enough. He almost got knocked out by Maidana. <laughs> he, got, mm. he got hurt badly in that rematch. But, but I think that's because Floyd's been conservative due, conservative due to his age. But that's just one thing I realized about Bars is uh, she has to hold that center, man. And she can do that against opponents who are intimidated by her presence, by her reputation as one of the best, if not the best female striker on the planet. But uh, any thoughts on what I just said about her movement cutting it off her defensive capabilities compared to her offense yeah in terms of circling I guess I can agree with you that yeah she does do circling a lot but not necessarily for for defense um I don't think Bars really takes a, a, a lot of headshots I'm not too sure about that yeah I think the reach she imposes is a big part of it yeah I mean, <clears throat> within the clinch, she's more susceptible to taking these headshots. But from a distance, she's, she's pretty much okay. Um, but yeah, in terms of her uh, defensive, I guess she could really incorporate a lot of more head movement. She doesn't really do that. She really kind of stays um, vertical with her head. And even when she's throwing the kick, she, her head is just there, opening open for shots. And I think that that, that, that comes as a testament to... To the fact that she she's tall and she uses that height height advantage, so she's so used to to staying out of range from those shots and not moving around as much. But then there comes a time where the opponent is able to come in and land shots of her own. So if Bars is able to to incorporate more head movement, um, be more evasive in her attacks, um, kind of um, follow through with her leg kicks and have her head off to the side a little bit more. And come into those leg kicks when she's a bit more tired. Then she'll be able to to do pretty well against um, um Ugi, and she'll she'll be able to avoid taking any more shots than necessary. Yeah, I agree. She can't pot shot so much from the outside. I, I think pot shotting is great when you're fighting a much stronger and bigger opponent, to where you necessarily can't take as many or as long risks trying to. Make them pu- trying to push them back with your own offense at the risk of getting hit. That you have to kind of play on the outside, but against someone like Ugi, who phys- same physical dimensions, really, I don't see a strength disadvantage Bars has over. I think Bars can hit harder. I think Bars can hit much harder. So I don't. I don't think she should pot shot from the outside and not dictate the distance. If you can't dictate the distance, you don't dictate the rhythm. You can't dictate the shots coming, and then you're solely relying on reaction time for your defense. And hoping that your opponent doesn't cut you off where you're about to go next. It doesn't become a chess match anymore. It becomes a cat and mouse game. Do you, you've seen Bars fight in MMA. She didn't have the best MMA record going 1-3. and three. How much of do you think Bars' fighting style in MMA where she was very much that pot shatter outside mover because she was scared of getting taken down do you think has translated into her Muay Thai game in a negative way? Okay, even in MMA, to be honest, I think... Um... There was opportunities for bars to to kind of close the distance and just utilize that clinch, even though that even though she's not exceptional in ground game and 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 defending against takedowns, there were opportunities in the cage where I saw bars um, had the opportunity, had the opponent against the cage, and she would back off. Yeah, and I think that also translates into a, a striking game now where. Where she kind of backs away, she'll she'll throw a few combinations come in, and then she'll walk backwards, kind of step away from the opponent. When I think it's not necessary, where she has the opportunity to give a little bit more, um, and to, and to finish what she started. Yeah, exactly. I, I think I think she uses attacks in the clinch as the way to finish her punch kick combinations. Like what she does really well is she punches, and then when you have the high forearm guard. 
she grabs double wrist control, lands a knee, and then exits it out on a pivot. But then that's not really necessarily fighting in the clinch as it is just using one move in the clinch in the set of your offense. She doesn't stay in there and treats it as an offensive area itself, in and of itself. So I think you're absolutely right. I think it's just, it could be personality. I mean, her personality might be the type who likes to just school you from the outside where she feels comfortable. Mm-hmm. And but again, she's only um, 26 years old. Yeah, she's only 26 years old. She has a lot of room to improve. She's 36 and 0 already. Mm. How much of do you think the age is going? Age factor will. Um, how much of age do you think will be a factor in this fight? With Bars being 26 and Ugi being 33. Uh, a little bit, not too much. I think I think Ugi will still be physically fit, and I don't think the age is that much of a distance. Um, difference when it, when Ugi's 33 years old. Um. Ugi might have a little bit more experience advantage. What are the, what's the record of Ugi here? Uh, Ugi is thirty two, fourteen, and zero. So Ooh. she's thirty two and fourteen. Yeah. Okay. All right. She has a few more fights than uh, Bars. Yeah, but Bars won every single. Yeah, she won every single one. Yeah. So I can't even even give the ex- experience argument here. Yeah. Um, but I don't think that um age is really much of a factor. I think once. Ugi hits around like on um, 35 and up, then it's gonna start really uh, um, taking a toll. But 33 and 36, uh, if she's a really good fighter, then she'll be alright. Yeah. But I might have to give it to Bars for this one. I'm gonna have to give it to Bars for this one too. Yeah. I think she has a deeper uh, vernacular of striking. I think she has more ranges she can fight in. She's athletically more gifted. I think she hits harder. I think. Uh, she she is just a very well-rounded striker. And <laughs> I know we said everything, all these criticisms, but I think she's a great striker and she's very well-rounded. One thing she can't, she just got to stop doing just is one thing she can't do anymore is when she's pressured, she keeps her head straight up in the air and moves back on a straight line. And then guys cl- and, and girls clock her with straight punches right there. But I don't think that'll be as much of a fact in this fight as it was in the cyborg fight because Ugi does not throw... Crisp, crisp, straight punches, or uh, really imposes that boxing game. She tries to get into clinch right away. So, we got bars in this fight by how? Mm, I think by decision. By decision? Yeah, I think by decision. You think you're giving her a knockout? I th- I think bars is gonna knock her out. You think so? Yeah, maybe not KO, but TKO. I think it's because bars has gotten stronger since 2007 when these two last fought. She packs more of a wallop. And I think Bars can stop Ugi. And I don't think Ugi... Um, you know, you just can't take that many shots, man. Yeah, that's you true. You really... If your game is based on withering the, uh, the, weathering the, the storm, storm, that there comes a point where you that, just can't. <laughs> and that chin degrades, I guess. And the body just breaks down, so... Yeah. Yeah. If not a TKO, definitely a decision. Yeah. I, I would I would, I kind of see a TKO by leg kicks. By I, leg I, kicks. Would def- I can definitely see that happening. Or a TKO via a teep, followed by punches rushing up against the corner or something like that. But we definitely have bars in this fight. And we're looking forward to it because it's really cool to see um, Lion Fight promote female Muay Thai and making it their main event. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I was reading an article about Ugi and she was saying that while fighting in Thailand for all those years and training in Thailand, that there is a level of misogyny in Thailand for female fighters. Oh, for real? They make female Muay Thai fighters uh, go under the bottom rope. When they enter the ring in their fight, Thai fighters they step over the top rope because they feel like going through the middle, let alone the bottom, represents bad luck. So you see Bukal go all over the ropes with both legs, and uh, they say that they when you first start as a female Muay Thai fighter, they don't put you in the ring; they put you on the bag. They say that they don't let you clinch when you're beginning with the guys if you're a female fighter, and they said that it's really difficult for female fighters to get top billing on cards. Because it is a male-dominated sport, mm. and I can, I can, I can definitely agree with it. But it's cool that uh, this is the main event, and it's two female fighters for Lion Fight Twenty, which is a big milestone. Uh, yeah. So let's give our fans a little, a little intermission. Stay tuned. Uh. Uh, thank you guys for checking out our first episode of season three. We hope you're enjoying the discussion so far, and it would be great if you guys could please follow us. 
on Facebook at All Kickboxing, on Twitter at All Kickboxing underscore, on YouTube at AKB space All Kickboxing, on Instagram at All Kickboxing, and we're also available on Sure Dog, All Kickboxing of course, on MMA Underground, as well as Bloody Elbow. And uh, Rico, could you, uh, what's that little website, Rico? What's that nice little, that sexy website, Rico? Long website, isn't it? Um, all kickboxing wix.com slash all kickboxing am i right yes you're absolutely right so it would be great if you guys could uh, check out check us out in all those places and um keep tuning in for our episodes because uh we have a lot more we have a lot more good stuff for you guys so that is it and back to the show uh so yeah let's move on to the next segment which is the co-main event between Chris Mosseri versus Sisak Sor Sirchai. All right, so Rico, give us your basic, your overall views of this fight. Okay, so Chris Mosseri fights out of Kingston. Kingston, New York. Kingston, New York, fights upstate. Um, fights out of the gym called Black and Blue MMA. And his record is 7-1, and one, and he's only 23 years old. And he's fighting for the welterweight um, division, mm-hmm. which is around 143 pounds. He's 5'9". And the style that Chris Mosseri has is a, is a very aggressive style. Um, big time pressure fighter. Um, sometimes to his own expense, where he's willing to, to walk into shots in order to, to dominate you. Um, very good clinch game, and he's very good at, at, at sweeping opponents. The last fight he had was against... Coke Chunawat. Coke Chunawat. Who's fought over 200 fights. And close to 200. Close to, Probably okay, more. Would, they don't record every fight yeah, in they, Thailand. Yeah, so... Around 200 fights. Um, so... Choke. <laughs> Forgive me. Coke. <laughs> Coke. <laughs> You're making it more difficult than it is Coke. Coke. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, Coke's... Koki is a very experienced Thai fighter, and um, Mosseri is very, very new into the game with only eight fights under his belt. But in his last fight, it was almost a clinic with, with um, with so many sweeps. Um, he really did ragdoll him in the fight, and Koki had nothing but respect for him during the fight, and Mosseri was able to win by decision. Um, Sidisak is a fighter from from Thailand. And he trains in Atlanta now, uh, out of a gym called Sidisak. He is originally from Bangkok, Thailand, but now he fights out of a Atla- uh, top Thai gym in Atlanta. So I think it's really interesting how a lot of Thai fighters today, especially some of them in Lion Fight, like Joe Natawat, um, Malapet. Yatsin Clyde doesn't train in America. He trains still in Fairtex Gym in Thailand. But uh, and Sidisak right now, how these guys fight? I mean, they train in America. Yeah, that's kind of that's interesting. That's that's very interesting. Um, that goes to show that um that the the American uh, uh, Muay Thai scene is is very is doing very well and is growing to the point that Thai fighters are willing to to leave their home country, um, to come over here and train, and. I mean that, that that's good news, um, for for both Thailand and the United States that we're both um um relating in terms of this martial art, and that um, Muay Thai is really becoming a scene in this country. So we're likely to see many more fighters actually leave Thailand and fight over here. I think it's a great transition. I think it's a great thing we're seeing where this just means more opportunities for Thai fighters. They don't have to. The old saying is, if you're a kid from the rural areas of Thailand, you pick a Muay Thai at 8, you retire at 21 Not because you've had 200 fights, and then you retire holding pads. You start kicking pads, and then you retire holding pads. Now, because of this international um, scene, Thai fighters have opportunities to fight in America against American fighters and getting more Western exposure. And as well as exposure and, and, and fame in Thailand, which they've a lot of them already achieved, and marketing. And it, it allows them to establish a brand as an athlete themselves fighting in America. I think it's great. 
long-term investment, much like how uh, Sanchai, Yatsen Klai, Malif, Pet, Buokao, all these Thai legends, Westerners know them. Like, if you say Buokao, I think Buokao is the face of Muay Thai for a lot of American fighters, who, yes. American people who don't, who think of K1 and Muay Thai. I think they think of Buokao in their heads. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I actually got introduced to Muay Thai. I think Buokao was like the first real Muay Thai fighter I saw. Because he took the step to fight in K1. Yeah, I think so too. I think Buokao has been synonymous with, with Muay Thai for such a long time. I remember training at ITC. And there was this kid named Chris. And he just started training at the gym. And he was talking about, oh, I want to be a Muay Thai fighter when I grow up. You know, Buokao? Buokao can fight. Buokao does Muay Thai. And yeah, Buokao has been a name for Muay Thai for such a long time. Because he was willing to, to make that transition into the Western world. And, and show what Muay Thai has to offer in combat sports. Exactly. They say that in Thailand, they don't call him Buokao. They say they call him a Buokao Superstar. Oh, <laughs> That's what they call him. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you mean Buokao Superstar. That's what they say. Yeah, yeah well, it's great that we're seeing Sivisak fight and Lion fight against uh, Western competition. And it's great for American fighters, too, because they, they get to test themselves against the best of the best uh, guys from Thailand. It's almost like how, like how in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, the Brazilian grapplers, they are, they're amazing. I wouldn't say they dominate... Uh, the world of BJJ because there's a lot of great American BJJ practitioners but when it comes to the Mundials Abu Dhabi a lot of them are from Brazil the winners the champions and a lot of Thai fighters are tremendous Stadium Lumpini Raj Modern champions but now we're seeing American fighters be able to test their medal against top flight competition and it's great for both sides for America and for Thailand anyway um, so Sidisak he stands 5 foot 7 He's at welterweight, close to 143 pounds, 26 years old with a record of 65 and 12. He began Muay Thai when he was 7 years old. He grew up on a rice farm in rural Thailand, and he's been fighting ever since. So, what do you think are the greatest strengths of Sidisak? Oh, Sidisak is very good yeah. in the clinch and with the elbow. Um... What I've noticed in in many of his fights is that if he catches you with the elbow and there's a cut or he sees an advantage with the elbow, he'll come from any angle to catch you with the elbow. He'll he'll come with a series of arm traps to 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 get your arm out of the way from defending yourself and he'll just crack you many times. Um he's also good with his low kick, is he good with low kick? I wouldn't say his low kick, but his kicks and his body kicks in general, they're very they're faster than most series, I must say. They're they're sharper, they're more efficient. Yeah. But I think you're right. Tight fighters, I think it's really hard to beat them in the clinch unless you have a level of strength, physicality over them. Which Moseri I don't know. I'm not sure if Moseri will be able to bully uh Sidisak and throw him around like he did against like Moseri did against Coke because of the age similarity. Masari's 23 versus Sidisak, who's 26. And Sidisak is a very young, technical, hungry fighter. Coke was a veteran who didn't, couldn't, who, I think, I forgot who said this, but they said how uh, Masari is a, is a great fighter, but at times his strength and athleticism makes up for areas where he lacks in terms of the mm. true um, nitty gritty of techniques, especially in the clinch. But in this past Coke fight, Chris showed that he really Chris. He's my he's my friend. Every I refer to him by my Chris. first name. Okay. <laughs> in that in that coke fight, he really showed little nuances in the clinch that, that were very impressive, like using the knee to trap to brace your opponent right on his body to prevent him from kneeing you back or to control the range and really dictate his movement. He was able to shuck his opponents around and not just standing in place doing trying to land a double collar tie and knee, but at every point he could disrupt their balance to where he could be able to control them longer and land effective clinch shots and sweeping them, especially when this was really impressive what he did against Kevin Ross. Kevin Ross is a is an American Muay Thai great, the current uh, super lightweight line fight champion. And when Kevin Ross, he went for a clinch knee, uh, Sidisak, not Sidisak, Mosseri, he swept out the standing foot. That's very difficult to do because you have to have very high posture to be able to do that effectively. Otherwise, you're like shrimping and trying to like sweep out your opponent's leg with your foot there's no power there so those little things he's starting to get better at 
So, and, I mean, another thing that we need to add about Mosseri is that um, before he was a Muay Thai fighter, he was also a gymnast. Yeah, he was a gymnast. He was thinking about going to the Olympics and everything. Wow, so he was a gymnast and he practiced MMA right. for, for quite some time. And then he fell in love with the art of Muay Thai. So, as we know, uh, um, MMA has a lot of a lot of clinch work, a lot of grappling, and it requires a, a lot of athleticism. So, some of those probably show when he when he comes into the clinch with, with many of his opponents, and also in, including the fact that he's very athletic due to other athletic things that he does. Yeah, I definitely agree. But now he's starting to mold the technique around his natural gifts which is a dangerous fighter, a guy who's physically gifted and dedicated. And uh, again, only 23, which is incredible. <laughs> um, with, you were talking about Slick Sack's ability to throw elbows from any angle, set up four elbows at any angle in the clinch. What did you think about what he did to Kevin Ross in Slick Sack versus Kevin Ross, which was uh, the first ever line fight back in February of 2011? So it was in the fourth round. Yeah. Um, Kevin Ross rushes in with uh, with an attack trying to get into the clinch. And what Sisak basically did was mask his elbow with his shoulder and came over with the elbow and cracked him right over the top. And Kevin Ross started bleeding yep. profusely. And from that point on, Sisak just saw blood and just started capitalizing on that. And like we said earlier... Thai fighters really focus on the clinch and many of the nuances that come along with that. So Sidisak was able to to get into to clinch position with um, Ross and really just capitalize on just on working that cut with the elbow, trying to get a stoppage or, or, or some sort of technical win out of that. And we might see this again with um with when he rushes Moseri. If Mosseri tries to rush in and um, Sisak catches him with the elbow, he's really going to play himself. And the only difference here between um, Mosseri and Sisak is that Sisak is much more better with the elbow and much more better in the clinch as opposed to Kevin Ross. So Mosseri really has to really be careful once he closes in with um, um, with Sisak. And he has to really be careful when coming in. Yeah. Because those elbows are a real threat. Yeah, I would you say Sidisag is a counter fighter? A counter clinch in the he uses the clinch for his counter fighting measures, but on the outside he throws beautiful kicks. Would you kinda of classify him as a rangy clinch counter fighter? Definitely. I think a lot of tight fighters are that style, wouldn't you say? Yeah, definitely. He's definitely a, a counter fighter. Um I necessarily don't use the clinch like that and whenever I spar I have never Throwing elbows because we don't do that. We're not on that level. Well, but, we don't have elbow pads. Yeah, we don't have we elbow pads either, so we can't be yeah. throwing uh, elbows at each other. So he's definitely a counter fighter with a strong clinch game, and he has he has his set of tricks up his sleeve um, for 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 opponents to fall into in order to catch you with an elbow and to get into that clinch, where he he does fairly well. Yeah, man, the elbow, I think it's a difficult shot to land because it's there's such a short reach on it that you don't want to overcommit like throwing an overhand with it and get badly badly out of position and countered. So the best time to throw is really doing against an over-eager opponent who falls into range of it, much like an uppercut. And against an aggressive fighter in Kevin Ross and in Chris Mosseri, that is a perfect shot to land. Chris Mosseri has always been a pressure fighter. He, he, Chris Mosseri is a pressure fighter to the T. He pushes the pace, starts fast, works fast... And why why I think Kevin Ross is such an interesting figure in this Mosseri Sisag matchup is that Sisag and Mosseri have a common opponent in Kevin Ross. When Chris Mosseri fought Kevin Ross in a Mosseri's first ever line fight, a Mosseri came out very aggressive with punch kick combos without the technical intricacies of the clinch. And then Ross, being the much seasoned veteran, just cracked Mosseri right on top of his eyebrow, like when, where the forehead is, which is a perfect place. For if you cut it open, the blood's gonna drip down right onto, right down that eye, and they they stopped the fight because of the cut because Moseri couldn't see. So, it wasn't the hardest elbow, it, it wasn't the tele, the most telegraphed elbow, it was it was actually an um, an uppercut elbow. 
like one of those that you throw to break your opponent's guard and come through. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful, man. There's just like nothing, no strain to it. Ross just grabbed Mosseri's right hand, the rear hand, and then just leveraged the oh. uppercut elbow as Mosseri was coming in. And you could hear the sounds. You heard it, and it just started bleeding like a gash. And then you know that when when you're in the heat of the battle and you have a lot of adrenaline pumping, that you bleed faster. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, especially out of your head. That being said, I don't think Ross Masseri is the best indicator to uh, judge Masseri's striking game on. Because when you get cut, especially one that bad, you're in a position where you have to rush the action and try to finish your opponent before the, re before the doctor says you can't fight anymore. Exactly. A rush fighter isn't the best fighter to judge his skills based on. So, what do you what what did you take away from Ross Mosseri? Um, that um, Mosseri has to really be careful when rushing in. Um, I know that he's a pressure fighter, but he has to uh, be a pressure fighter with some sort of diligence, and he can't just rush in at any opportunity. He has to be wary of the fact that the opponent can clock you coming in, um, catch you with elbows, and you'll get into yourself in a position where. Maybe you could have won the fight if you didn't have a cut, and um, you could have you could have gotten a decision. But due to the lack of diligence and, and waiting for the right time to close the distance, and with some sort of controlled pressure fighting, um, you'll be you you weren't able to do that because you were rushing it too much, and and he has to be very wary of that, especially fighting an opponent like Sidisak, yeah. who's a counter fighter and. Is definitely going to be waiting for him to to fight the way he does. Yeah, I think Sidisak has a lot of similarities to Ross's fighting style. I think Ross is more aggressive. I think Ross pressures more than Sidisak. But there's a reason why that Sidisak Ross matchup was so exciting because you there were clashing style. There there were similarities in both of the in the way both of them fought, and you saw that play out how those similar styles clashed against each other. Um, I also think that. Sidisak, would you say that Sidisak has, he's a cool operator. He really knows how to tie defense and offense seamlessly together in that tie fashion where, for instance, let's say Mosseri does a, a right roundhouse body kick. Sidisak, he catches it, he kicks back as that foot retracts that Mosseri just kicked with, or he, Mosseri does a high kick, Sidisak leans back, returns a high kick of his own. It seems that Sidisak really has a sharp defensive efficient game. What are your thoughts on that? He must have really dr drilled in those, those kind of fighting techniques. Yeah. Where where the opponent throws a high kick, you you rock back, return with a kick of your own. Um, opponent throws a, throws a body shot, you're able to catch it, or you're able to, to come with a strike of your own. So, Sidisak is, uh, is really a counter fighter to the bone. Yeah. And he really uses a... Uh, 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 um, his opponent's attacks to come with attacks on, of his own. And we're going to see a lot of that when they're fighting on the outside range. Mm -hmm. And when Mosseri is ready to come in, we're going to see counter fighting in the clinch range. So he, he's definitely a counter fighter all the way through. In the outside range as well as within clinch range, he's a counter fighter. Yeah, what, what really opened my eyes to uh, how just efficient and calm... Sidisak is playing this defensive outside game is when he fought another Thai fighter who what really opened my eyes to how defensively sharp Sidisak was when it was when he fought a fellow Thai fighter in America and it played out like a typical Thai fight where the pace escalated gradually. First round was very slow. They were feeling each other out with kicks from the outside and the knockout came in the third which is a lot of times when knockouts happen in Thailand when this was crazy. Sidisak, he catches a low kick from his opponent, right low kick, and then he steps in with a right cross and finishes it right there. Mm. It came out of nowhere. It was almost like you didn't expect this guy to pack that much power because he was being so conservative before, but he has fight finish and counter power. But what I said there was how Thai fighters, they start slow, which is the tradition in Thailand where the reason why Thai fighters start slow isn't only because they want to feel their opponents out. It's also because as a culture, that is when guys are placing bets. Mm. <laughs> that's true that's when audience members tourists uh, they say that those guys are up on the high risers up on the top stands that's where the better 
heaviest betting goes on is up there. That's when they're taking bets. So Thai Fair slowed down on purpose because I think maybe, maybe they make money off of that too. And then round two and three, they kill each other. That's when finishes happen. So Mosseri as a guy whose first round looks like round three, who is always pressuring, how much do you think his ability to overwhelm Sisak early would be a, will be a factor? I doubt. Maybe it'll have like a little bit of effect. Um, Sarasak might be able to, to to get caught with a few shots coming from from Moseri. But what I think is going to happen is that um, Sarasak is going to be able to readjust himself quickly. Um, within that kind of pressure fighting and within that kind of that kind of beat in such an early round. That Sisak will be able to, you know, get his rhythm and fight like he's in the in the third round as well. Um, it usually happens a lot to Thai fighters, like when they start, because um, they're so used to fighting slow in the beginning that um, Western fighters who are so used to starting at a high pace um, kind of catch them off guard. But after a while, they kind of get used to it, and they start to get their rhythm, and they start to to kind of calibrate and, and, and fight at the same pace or even harder than their opponent. So. Sidisak might be able to get caught. If if Moseri has a chance to, 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 to knock Sidisak out, um, it might happen in the first round. Yeah, that's what I think too. If the yeah. knockout's going to happen, it's going to come in the first for yeah. Moseri. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Moseri's best uh, shot is the right low kick and the right counter overhand uh, punch. Those are his best shots. And uh, I think what we're going to see is Sidisak be able to perhaps use that aggression against Moseri in round one with the elbows we talked about earlier. What do you think are Chris Moseri's biggest strengths? Um, one thing I really like about him is that he's able to switch stances. Um, that's something that I like to do, and um, I've noticed that Moseri also does that. So he's able to switch from um, from orthodox to southpaw and come over with hooks from that position and kicks also. So that is, that is very effective in, in, in stand-up fighting. And that's one thing that I kind of like about Chris Moser and I like seeing. So I'm hoping to, to see a lot of that um, when he faces Sidisak. Uh, of course, like like we already know, he's a very good pressure fighter. Mm -hmm. And he, he, he turns up the heat, starts to fight fast. And he mixes up elbows and, and knees very well within the clinch when he's pressure fighting. So we're going to see a lot of that. And we're going to see a lot of good clinch technique coming from him so hopefully he does a very good job in his clinch technique and he has a, a, a very good improvement because the 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 opponent that he's fighting is also good at the clinch so uh, i'm looking forward to seeing a lot of clinch fighting in this match yeah i think so it'll be interesting to see uh young, the young Maseri where his clinch game stacks up against Sidisax. But what you talked about there, the switching, the stand switching game of Chris Mosseri, I think is very crafty. I think Mosseri's offensive game is underrated in how crafty he is. He shift punches. It's not uh, that obvious, which is the way you should shift punch. He doesn't go to it, doesn't go to the well too many times. But the times he, just, he chooses to do it are when he tries to trap you against the ropes or in the corner tries to cut off an opponent trying to exit out to the left or the right side by switching stances, by kicking, trapping them with roundhouse kicks, and that overhand right hook you talked about from the southpaw stance. It's very crafty, and, and his uh, left body kick has a very nice left body kick. He is offensively, fundamentally, very sound in terms of his weight transfer, in terms of keeping his guard up bef uh, after he throws his, having one hand up after he throws a punch to make sure he's well defended. He's offensively very clean. Now, it's about how, um, it's the little nuances, I think, that are going to play a big factor. And if uh, Masseri can impose that pressure fighting game effectively. But one thing that I saw about Masseri that I think he can improve on is he tends to shell up too much. It, it seems to be his go-to most comfortable form of defense is that high Dutch kickboxing guard. But that is not what you want to do against Sidisak, who can easily break through your guard with an elbow, with an uppercut elbow, or hand trap you, push your glove down to where it creates space for to land an overhand elbow, or clinch you with a double wrist uh, with double wrist control and knee the body. It's not. I never agree with the double forearm guard as as a go to defensive measure. I think it can be a defensive measure when you're in desperation mode and you just need to weather the storm perhaps for a little bit. But even then, I'm still not a big fan of it. It's a go to in kickboxing. Not necessarily a go-to in Muay Thai. 
Yeah, and yeah, that's a good point. In Muay Thai, because of the clinch, you really can't afford to do that. Yeah. Uh, but then again, <laughs> Sir Chai, he actually doesn't impose, doesn't have that much head movement either. Sir Chai's uh, defense relies heavily on the stiff arm, and at times, I want to say he shells up, but I don't see him bobbing, weaving, moving his head as much. Aside from when he is dodging kicks by leaning his head back. That is one of the more common defensive forms for Thai fighters. Is they lean back to keep their back flexible to dodge kicks. And as well as punches. It's actually one of the things that Andy Risty has adopted. One of the reasons why he beat Petrosian and Ruzman. Was just that little defensive tactic he just drilled over and over again. Which is just a light head movement, head rock back. But again, that is one thing that can easily be capitalized by an opponent who can extend the range of his shot. And then catch you with your head stuck up in the air where you're very out of position and not off balance and your spine is crooked. So, um, I also think that cardio is going to play a big factor. When it comes to these physical attributes, Mosseri wins on every count in terms of cardio, strength, athleticism, speed. That's a big factor, man. Skill is important, but when skill uh, meets someone with perhaps lesser skill, but much more physical attributes in relation to that skill I just mentioned, that other fighter tends to win, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's true. That's true. There comes a point of uh, um, balance when it comes to having only skill versus a guy who has both skill and physicality. And I think that Mosseri effectively pressures by cutting off the ring, by making sure he doesn't wade, in, wade into clinch elbows, by using his low kick. He'll be able to wear... Sidisak down later in the fight. And I saw in uh, Sidisak versus Ross how later on in the fight, Sidisak began to eat many more leg kicks because I think it was a result of him getting tired, not willing to lift his leg up to check it. And uh, Sidisak, uh, Sidisak also, similar to Mosseri at times, keeps his head static and upright, which is a big problem. You know, I think uh, Kevin Ross is actually the opposite of that. Kevin Ross has some of the best head movement I've seen in Muay Thai, where he slips. It's very efficient and minimal. He loves that inside... He stands orthodox, Kevin Ross. He loves that inside left slip into the liver shot or inside left slip into the hook. He has a very good head movement uh, game. And I think both Sidisak and Mosseri, they keep their head static and upright. And with that high tie guard of Sidisak, it's, it's susceptible to uppercuts and knees up the middle. So I'm going to read a quote that Sidisak said regarding how he's going to be Mosseri. And he says... He keeps moving forward on his opponents, so we need to be able to keep him off of me. Well, which is true, but at the same time, how are you going to do that? I, like I said, similar to Bars and Ugi, there's I think there's going to be some similarities in the fight where we're going to need Sidisak to show, uh, to to make Maseri respect his power in the center. And I don't think he is willing to do that as much as someone like Kevin Ross did. Kevin Ross really tried to work Mosseri back for every mistake a rookie made. Counters, elbows, and everything. So, who do you have in this fight? Mm, I might have to give it to Sidisak for this one. Yeah? Yeah, I think Sidisak for this one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I think Sidisak will be able to 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 um kind of neutralize um Mosseri's um forward pressure fighting to an extent. He says he's going to try and keep Mosseri off of him. I doubt he'll keep him off of him. But I think that, that he'll hurt him every time all Mosseri tries to come in. Yeah? Yeah. But. Uh, Sidisak has, has an excellent teep. Like a lot of TIE fighters do. TIE fighters use their teeps like a, a jab. It's beautiful and it's frustrating. And when you get frustrated as a pressure fighter, you tend to be over eager and make mistakes. But I see what you're saying, how Sidisak can uh, counter a pressure fighter and Mosseri. I got Mosseri in this You got Mosseri? I just simply think uh, he has the skills now, especially what he showed against Coke. He's not the same fighter as he was who fought Kevin Ross. Against Kevin Ross, he came out like like a kickboxer, really. Like a kind of like a rumble kickboxer where he's just going to put shots and combos on you and not think in a two-dimensional manner, which is something that I want you and I to work on, which is one of the signs of a beginner fighter. Chris Mosseri is like an expert compared to us. Yeah, But one of the signs of a beginner fighter is that they only think one-dimensionally about what they're going to do to their opponent. They don't think about what their opponent's going to react in relation to what you do. They don't think about how your actions are going to cause a reaction 
or anything like that. They think very one-dimensionally, not two-dimensionally. They don't think about counters. They don't think about counters to counters or counters to counters to counters. And one great example of this is uh, a boxing example is I saw this. This is how Maidana almost knocked out Floyd in their rematch where Floyd would draw out a counter response from Maidana by throwing a jab. He knew that Maidana was trying to counter that with a cross right counter over the top all day. So if Floyd would throw a, you know, a garbage jab, a junk jab, Maidana would do a right cross, and Floyd knows that's coming, so he's a step away, pulls his head back, throws a rock away, Maidana's punch grazes past Floyd's face, and Floyd comes back with a right cross of his own. That's a counter to a counter, mm -hmm. because you just created a counter from your opponent. But then, what Maidana did this next time is, Floyd did the jab again, Maidana tried to come over the top, Maidana knew Floyd was going to counter his counter. So what Maidana did was after Floyd threw that punch, Maidana slipped it, slipped to the inside left, and then landed an overhand right as both guys were exchanging cross punches. And Floyd almost got knocked out there. He like stumbled back. Luckily, nice. there was three seconds left in the round and he like got right on the stool. Because I think his, his, knees his knees buckled there. So that's a counter to a counter to a counter. <laughs> there is a <laughs> you see it's simple that's a very I think great example to wrap your head around that idea because it's just two shots in Muay Thai dude like it's so much more complicated yeah cause you, ha you have to incorporate knees <sighs> kicks and and everything else exactly yeah so boxing that's why I think one of the reasons why boxing is called the sweet science is because it's simple enough boxing is very diff complicated and I know but it's simple enough to where you can really like distill it and specialize and hone certain skills and moves as to where it looks like coordinate, um, clean, efficient, structured work of art. Muay Thai can get very chaotic very quick because there's so many more weapons. There's grappling. There's like literal grappling. There's cuts and everything, jumping shots. And so um, what, I mean, what I mean by that is I think uh, Moseri is not that type of one-dimensional fighter anymore. He sees counters as counters. He thinks a step ahead. Sidisak uh, arguably has has been this way for a longer time because he beat the great Kevin Ross. You know, I that was a split decision win for split decision win for Sidisak, but I thought Sidisak did enough in that fight to where like a split might be calling a two close. So um I got Moseri because I think he's matured more as a technical thinking man's thinking striker and he has a physical youth strength attributes to go along with it. And it'll be great to see another New York guy uh, in addition to so many great New York fighters nowadays, come up in the world of Muay Thai. To Kingston! <laughs> <laughs> Kingston! So, uh, yeah, any, any closing thoughts? Um, be sure to catch his fight on Access TV for those who live in the States. It's Live Fight 20, so we have two great fights coming up. Especially, I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of great undercards as well. Yeah, let's uh, run down the card right here. So, the main event, of course, is Yurina Barge versus Sean Taluji. And then the co-main is Chris Masseri versus Sidisak. There's also a lot of other great fights like uh, Jason Andrada versus John Nofer. Tom Evans versus Julio Pena. Tim Amron versus Bri Bryce Lawrence. And many more. So, it's a mm -hmm. very stacked card. A lot of East Coasters. A lot of East Coast. You're right. Yeah. You see uh, Pennsylvania there, Boston, uh, Mysterious from New York, of course. But the main event will be the Women's Welterweight Championship between Bars and Sean Taluji. So definitely tune into this card. It's going to be great um, on Access TV on February 20th. And uh, I'm gonna. I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to watching it. You? Yeah, I'm definitely going to watch it. Awesome. So... All right, guys, thank you for tuning in to the clinch number 14. We hope you enjoyed our show and definitely come back to check out not just our next podcast, but also give All Kickboxing, uh, check us out. We're All Kickboxing, available on Facebook under All Kickboxing, under Twitter at All Kickboxing underscore. Our YouTube channel is AKB All Kickboxing. We're, label, we're, we're available on iTunes at All Kickboxing. Our website is allkickboxing.wix.com slash all kickboxing and wix is spelled w-i-x it is a very long url i know and you'll be able to find that link in our social media handles also we're on instagram at all kickboxing so if you're a fight fan if you're a guy who practices fights or just a really you know who just loves the sport 
and loves the technical intricacies as well as the cultural aspect of what we try to bring about the world of fighting and Muay Thai. I think you'll really, I think you'll, you'll dig us. You, <laughs> you'll dig us. We got sparring matches, technique breakdowns, podcasts, funny videos, everything. So, Rico? Goodbye, guys. Goodbye. <laughs> yeah. We close it. All right, guys. Thank you for checking us out. This was a clinch number 14.